Two things we must do in the summer. Nourish our values and protect. Nourish like a mother, protect like a father. The twin challenges in the summertime help to illustrate life, that we are confronted with both good and evil. Is that the way it should be? You've got to ask somebody a little higher up than me. We could get into a, probably a pretty great debate. Would there be good without evil? Here's the best, best answer I've got in our finite position at the moment. Here's the best answer. It doesn't seem like it. It seems like it takes the contrast to make a scenario, to make an adventure. Now, remember, we didn't set it up. So, But here, here's what seems to be the setup. Opposites in conflict. That seems to be the setup for a human adventure. One contesting against the other. Vying for the territory. Would there be light without darkness? We probably wouldn't call it light. What gives us the value of one is the contrast of the other. But darkness is always trying to move in and take all the territory. But if you turn on the light, it, its energy starts to repel darkness. Darkness begins to move away, move away. And the, the brighter the light, the further away the darkness must move. If you walk into a dark room and turn on the light, the darkness is what? Gone. But here's the point to remember. Not very far. The darkness seems to be, yes, it's gone, but it, it's waiting. Waiting for its chance. That if energy, light loses its energy, darkness has a chance not to move back in. Here's one of the, the better realistic illustrations, and that's health and illness at odds in your body. Illness trying its best to drive health into a small corner and occupy the territory. And health trying what? To push illness into a small corner. There's this contest going on. Who's going to occupy the territory? If one stays strong, the other is diminished. If the other gains in power, then the other is diminished. See? So what you must learn to do is cooperate with the positive side of everything in your body and your life. Sometimes we sabotage our own best interest. The body needs a banana, you send it a Coca-Cola. And the body says, what is the deal here? I'm, I'm health trying to drive illness into a small corner. I ordered a banana, you send me a Coca-Cola. So the body could rightfully say what? Whose side are you on? Give us a break here. We need every tool we can get to keep illness at bay. Because if we get weak, I'm telling you, it moves in, moves in, moves in, takes the territory. So we're in the middle of this contest. And here's what it's called, opposites in conflict. Here's one of the bigger conflicts, liberty and tyranny. Liberty is the absence of tyranny. But even though tyranny is, is conquered, it, it's not very far away. The same goes on in your bloodstream. Red corpuscles to nourish like a mother and give life. White corpuscles to fight and kill like a father. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. If I don't kill it, what? It killed you, somebody's going to get killed. In this contest, right? Good, evil, liberty, tyranny, right? Health, illness, winning and losing us, right? There's, a, there's the struggle going on. But here's the key. It's the only way, it seems, it's the only way to create a human adventure. It doesn't seem to be any other way currently, currently. Now, some speak of a new heaven and a new earth, and maybe the whole arrangement will be different. Could very well be, but in this current experience, it seems like to create an adventure, to create a unique human scenario, we need opposites and conflict. And that's the deal. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. Tyranny and liberty. Saddam Hussein takes over Kuwait. What should we do? Somebody says, well, Kuwait, what do we care? Well, what if next he wants uh, Saudi Arabia? You say, well, it's a pile of sand, what do we care? Well, what if next he wants Israel? You say, well, little Israel, what do we care? Well, what if next he wants the rest of the Mediterranean? You say, well, yes, I guess we've got to draw a line somewhere. Yes, somewhere. You've always got to draw a line somewhere and tell illness, hey, you can't have any more. You've got to throw up the barriers. 
draw a line in the sand. Our president, George Bush, was right to draw a line in the sand, put together the coalition, and put together a half a million troops and go kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. History demanded it. Hired Chief White Corpuscle General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> I met the general a couple of times. He was the man to send. So, liberty and tyranny in a contest. And it's the only way to have a civilized society. Tyranny cannot be rehabilitated. Tyranny can only be restrained. So, for Saddam Hussein, we put a no-fly zone on top and a no-fly zone on the bottom. Right. To contain so that liberty would have a chance. The citizens of the world would have a chance. That the world would have a better chance. And we've got to fight these skirmishes. We've been fighting them forever. We've got to fight them forever. Whether they're inside your own body or whether they're in politics, no matter where they are. We must play this game. We must fight this game. But here's what it creates. A great adventure. Let me give you the ultimate now. Could you win if you couldn't lose? And the answer is no, it doesn't seem like it. You, you couldn't call it winning. You can't win if you couldn't lose. So that's the deal now. Negative, positive. Would there be negative, uh, positive without negative? No, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like this is the current setup, you know, for the foreseeable future. It looks like it's been that way as long as we can remember and as long as the history tells us. So here's what you want to do if you want the adventure. You must learn to play this game, to work with all the positive forces to defeat the negative forces as early and as soon and as much as possible, to contain the ravages of disease that want to take you early. You've got to fight back. You can't just leave it. Somebody says, well, I've got my fingers crossed. Not a good philosophy. You've got to take your vitamins. You've got to do the stuff. You've got to do the deal. Jump on the positive side of whatever you want and see if you can't help out in this warfare, and this push-shove match. That's the key. So in the summer, here's what you must do. Nourish the plants and the garden. Nourish your values like a mother. Give life. Whatever you start now, you must nourish it and give it life. Don't neglect a new life if you've started a new life. What if you said to a brand new mother, where is your baby? She says, I have no idea. You would say, no, that isn't right. If you start a new life, you must care for it. You must protect it. You must give it life, give it nourishment. Now, here's the other part. You must protect it like a father. That's why the old wise man said, we must learn to love and hate. So underline that. You must learn to love and hate. And the illustration he used was, you must learn to love good and hate evil. To deal with the weeds in your garden, you've got to hate weeds. You've got to hate them enough to what? Kill them. You can't say, well, poor weeds. Say, no, this ain't the deal, poor weed. Don't go soft on this stuff now. You've got to hate evil. You've got to hate the weeds that are out to destroy your garden and rob your children of the nourishment they deserve. So here's the deal. Love like a mother, hate like a father. And here's the rest of it. Give life like a mother and take life like a father. You've got to take the life of the weeds or they will take the life of your garden. Somebody's going to get killed. Remember? So you must be like a father. Any father would say to whatever threatens his family, take three more steps toward this family, you'll cease to exist. I'm father. I kill. So send out the warning. Send out the signal. Both mother and father reside here. Mother nourishes and father gives protection. And yes, it's possible to love like a father and hate like a mother. Just so you get both done. In fact, nothing more dangerous than an angry mother. Especially in the animal kingdom. Mess with mama bear's cubs. If you're a threat to her cubs, she'll kill you. That's that female mother instinct. Kill first, talk later. Okay, you got that now? It's good advice. We're going to learn in communication shortly. You've got to learn to put love and hate in the same sentence. Because it's vitally important. Sometimes you must say to your children, what? I love you, but I hate what's going on. They've got to know what you love and what you hate. 
You don't hate them, but you hate what's going on. You hate the dangers. So, learn the good evil. Summer time. Now, here's the greatest battle in the mind. Here's what you must not become in the summer in your mind. A victim of yourself. What is that insidious voice inside your own head that says, you're too short, it'll never work for you, you're too tall, right? It's over for you, right? It's never worked for you before. What gives you any idea that it'll work for you now? You've never been able to rise up and take charge of your life. What makes you think you can do it now? There's going to be too many obstacles out there. You'll never overcome them all. What is that insidious voice? It's the same game going on inside your head that's going on in the world. Liberty and tyranny in a push-shove match. And here's what you've got to do. Cooperate with the positive side of your life and let faith drive out doubt, right? Let winning drive out losing. Let positive drive out negative. But you've got to get into the contest. And why get into the contest? Because that's how you create an adventure. There is no other way. It takes both. You've got to learn to laugh, yes, but that's not what the wise men only said. You can't just learn to laugh and keep on laughing. No, that's silly. It says there's also a time... To cry, you've got to learn to both laugh and cry. Then it said you must be so sophisticated as not to laugh when it's time to cry. Then it further said you must learn to laugh with those that laugh and learn to cry with those that cry. That now gives you an understanding of what life is all about. Sadness and joy, the contest, the difference. And yet it creates the adventure. What if you went to listen to the symphony orchestra and the symphony only played little happy high notes all evening. Just little pleasant happy high notes. How much of that could you take? <laughs> you know, don't you want to hear the crash of the cymbals that scares you to death? Don't you want to hear the, the minor key of the music that shows you the tragedy as well as the triumph? And the answer is yes, play me the whole orchestra. I can handle it because that's what life is all about. Positive negative. What if the minister only prayed happy prayers every Sunday? How much of that could you take? Happy, happy, every Sunday, every Sunday, happy, happy. How much, how much could you take? Who's going to pray angry prayers? Who's going to pray frustrated prayers? Who's going to weep in public for the lost children? It takes both. You've got to weep with those that weep and laugh with those that laugh. You've got to have this full understanding of the game. You've got to understand the highs and the lows the tragedy and the triumph. Most of the music of the world is written in the minor key, the key of pathos and sadness and mystery and wonder. You can't eliminate that from your life. It takes both to create an adventure. But here's the adventure, to overcome the evil, to put evil in its place. Just like in your mind, you've got to stand guard at the door of your mind and see if you can't suppress, see if you can't do battle with the negative forces. Don't become a victim of yourself. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse, but also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. And see if you can't engage in this mental contest and win the day. That's the summer. Now here's one more season, and that's the season of harvest. Here's the key to remember harvest time. In due season, in due time, when it's time. And part of this is to develop the patience so that when it's time, it will come. But you cannot be impatient. Patience is part of the game here. You can't plant the seed and two or three days later dig around and say, where's my crop, where's my crop? Say, no, come on, that's foolish. We'll take you away to some safe place. Just... You got to plant and what? You've got to plant and wait and exercise patience. And then when it comes time, you give it nourishment and you give it care and you give it protection. And then you've got to wait some more and you've got to wait some more and you've got to wait some more. But here's what it says. In due time, in due season, when it's ready, when it's time for you, whatever it is, financially, socially, personally, economically, whatever the time, when it's time, your harvest will come. The old wise man said what? Run the race. And the prize will be yours if you don't faint. And sometimes in the summer, it's easy when the sun is hot to faint, to spend less time. But if you faint not, 
if you're there ready after this activity of summer, do the summer work. Just make the little note. Do the work of summer. Nourishing, protecting. Whether it's family, whether it's business, the work of summer. Now, the harvest. Here's the key now to harvest, to wisely use the resources. When your harvest comes now, you can't blow it all. You can't spend it all. You can't live it all up. Remember the two parts to life. One, the full development of all your potential. Second, the wise use of all your resources. Tomorrow, one of our major subjects is going to be the management of time, time management. If we have time, we'll go through that. Who has said I'm going to cover procrastination, but I've decided to put that off till tomorrow. The management now of your resources when they come. An ancient story says they took the seven years of plenty and they didn't live it all up. Make the note. You must take the seven years of plenty and not live it all up. What did they do? They used the seven years of plenty to get ready for the next seven years of famine. The first seven to prepare for the next seven. We'll talk more about that tomorrow under financial independence. So the subject of the season, so vital, so important. Such a great illustration to almost every life situation you can think of. It'll help your kids. It'll help your business. It'll help your management people, your salespeople. Everybody. This could be one of our best seasons in terms of the world. The turning of the century. Everybody's thinking about the year 2000. A new century, a new millennium, a new beginning, a new chance, a new opportunity for world cooperation, national, international cooperation. What can we do to play our small part in the whole wide-ranging scheme of things? It's good that everybody's thinking about this. This could be a new time, a new chance, a new opportunity. Right? Yes, we've blown it in the past. And we've messed it up in the past. But maybe, just maybe this time, there's enough technology and enough sanity and enough spirit and enough righteousness and enough rightness, enough stuff to make this the opening years of the next centuries, some of the most promising years in the last 6,000. Wow. Wow. Now, make these quick notes and we're going to take a break. The four steps to success. These personal development subjects are just vitally important. The first step to success is good ideas. You must be a collector of good ideas. Here's where my mentor did me the greatest of service, and that was keeping a journal of good ideas. Here's what he said. Don't trust your memory. What classic information. Don't trust your memory. If a good idea comes, jot it down. One, so you can review it. Two, so that you capture it. It won't be lost. So all those years back then, I started keeping a journal. I got journals you wouldn't believe. Little cheap ones when I first started. So remember the Greg shorthand? Little books, little spiral things? I used those. You could say, you must be broke. Yes, you know, I wasn't doing very well, so it cost, I don't know, a quarter or something. Now my journals are expensive. This one costs $42. And I wish it would have cost more because I'm doing really well. <laughs> my journals. But uh, if you look at all my journals, you can tell how my life was going. Say he was poor here and it looks like he was rich here. And then he was broke again. And now it looks like he's rich again for sure. So, but here's the key. And we'll talk about this more also under time management. Something to pass on to the next generation. The collection of ideas that made you healthy. The collection of ideas that turned your life around. The collection of ideas that uh, caused you to learn extra skills and got the extra income. The wise use of your resources. The ideas you found on how to do that. Think of passing this on now to the next generation and the next generation. This is so valuable. But mostly now, primarily for your own study. So you can go back over what you've collected. And in a now different place, same ideas, but now that you're in a different place, you'll see it in a whole new light on how it will help change your business, help change your career, your future, relationships, and all the rest. Keeping a journal, right? Now, this is for serious students. Non-serious students don't need to keep a journal. 
but for serious students that are serious about their health and serious about their future, serious about gathering things to make a contribution to others, keeping a journal. That's important. A collection of good ideas, first step to success. Here's the next step, a good plan. You've got to have a good plan. You've got to have a good health plan. My mentor asked me when I'm 25, Mr. Owen, what's your current plan for your financial future? And I said, I don't have one. Right? And that was obvious. He said, you've got to create a plan, a good financial plan. If we finished the seminar tomorrow and, and you lingered a while and gave me the details of your current financial plan for the future, would I get so excited about it, I'd go across the country and lecture on it? you say, no, Mr. Owen, you probably wouldn't want to lecture on my plan. My next question would be what? Why not? Have you reached this point in your life's maturity and you don't have a plan that's got you up early and keeping you up late that you're excited about unfolding? We're going to talk more about this tomorrow under financial independence. Here's one of the first things you must do if you're a parent. Build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Now, there's other protections that a parent must engage in. But here's one of the first ones, since it's so possible living in America. A financial wall around your family nothing can get through. Got to have a good health plan. You know, you can't be out of breath after the year 2000. You got to have the vitality, right? You got to have the breath. You got to have the vitality. So you got to have a good health plan. You got to have a good financial plan. You've got to have a good plan for your goals and plans and dreams, and we're going to get into our workshop tomorrow. We'll go through all of that. So number one is good ideas. Number two is good plans. Here's two more. Here's number three, learning to handle the passing of time. That's one of the big challenges in everybody's life, learning to handle the passing of time. And then here's number four, the solving of problems. And that's what life is all about, taking them on, finding solutions, executing, Recording progress. Mm -hmm.